thank you, thank you, Michelle. And welcome to all of you. Thank you to our Thursdays. Uh, welcome to our Thursdays with NOMA 2021 Stroll Edition. Uh, before we begin tonight, I'd like to introduce NOMA's Stroll Coordinator, Martin Collins, uh, who has a special statement to share with all of us tonight. Martin. Thank you, Naria. Michelle, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. The Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling is excited to announce that they will reopen to the public this Saturday, June 5th. Come experience two new exhibitions by their artists in residence, La Huerta y Hoy, uh, The Garden and I, and But No Elephants. Developed by the Broadway housing communities, the Sugar Hill Children's Museum is the cultural heart of the Sugar Hill Project. Led by Executive Director Ellen Baxter, BHC has pioneered high impact solutions to the challenges of deep generational poverty and homelessness in Upper Manhattan with an innovative model leveraging the synergies of housing, education, and the arts to create a lasting change for underserved children and families. The museum provides our culturally rich neighborhood with a space where children and families grow and learn about Sugar Hill and the world at large through intergenerational dialogue with artists, art, and storytelling. Please visit sugarhillmuseum.org for more information. Our thanks to the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling for sponsoring Thursdays with Noma and artist Lyria Levin. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin, and thank you to the Sugar Hill Museum for your support. And good evening once again to all of you. It is so wonderful to see you here again tonight. My name is Neria Leva Gutierrez, and I am the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, also known as NOMA. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Stroll, and thank you for being here, for supporting us, and for helping us honor and celebrate our incredible artists. As I said last week when we had the Extraordinary Dister with us, all eyes are on Washington Heights, uh, and the premiere of the Brothers film next week promises to let the world know what we already know, and that is that we are an amazing community, and our artists tell that story over and over and over again. And as I also mentioned last week, it's an exciting time for us at NOMA. We just recently moved our offices to the Annex at the United Palace, which comes with four studios that we look forward to translating into much needed space for our uptown artists and for our arts organizations. And we really look forward to welcoming you all to our new space soon. We have a lot to be grateful for, um, and we are grateful for many, many things. And in particular, we are grateful to our sponsors who have really committed to supporting us this year. And there are so many to name, and I'll quickly go through them. Warner Brothers, Spectrum, longtime supporters, Telemundo, West Harlem Development Corporation, Cana, DCLA, council members, um, uh, uh, Levine and Rodriguez, HBO, United Way, New York Presbyterian, and Google, with whom we are absolutely thrilled to be partnering with for the first time. And as part of our partnership, we want to encourage you all to attend tomorrow's free workshop, which will teach artists and professionals how to op optimize their brand um, and there are some great assets and gifts as well as part of the workshop. And I know Martin will be putting information later in the chat and also giving further information. Um, speaking of the chat, as you all know, this is an interactive evening. And so we encourage you to participate tonight. Feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout the evening, and we will give you a chance to ask them of our featured guest, which I am now thrilled to introduce. Born in Russia and raised partly in Odessa, now Ukraine and Moscow, Lily Levin arrived in Washington Heights at the age of 17, where she lives and works with her husband and two children. She earned her BFA from Barnard and an MFA from Hunter College, and she is an artist, educator, and designer. In fact, up until the pandemic, she worked for 15 years in the fashion industry and as a senior jewelry designer for Kate Spade and Company. As a dedicated educator, she has volunteered as an art teacher in the New York City public schools, and she has taught classes in Washington 
Washington Heights. She has worked for Arts in Action, and she has directed Arts Next Door. She is clearly dedicated and invested in our neighborhood, creating posters and CD covers for local artists and founding Art Lakela. She is a painter, an illustrator, a graphic artist, participating in several group shows in LA, in Boston, and all over New York, including several at NOMA. She is also the third place winner of this year's Stroll Poster Contest. I think we have her wonderful design, um, and perhaps you may have caught her being interviewed on Monday night on the Rick H. podcast talking about her entry and the stroll. Um, here it is. Just fantastic. Really does capture um, uh, the the energy um, of our of our community in, in so many ways and, and sort of um, uh, really just just an extraordinary dynamic design. Uh, congratulations. Uh, her illustrations have appeared in magazines like Slate and in two children's books on music. Lilia's work, which we will see, has tremendous breadth, and it's informed by her experiences in Russia and America and offers viewers windows into very human and equally complex experiences. Occupied with loss, with change and displacement, the world she offers also suggests hope and redemption. And though they volley between these two highly expressive states, they are clear in their indictment of war and injustice. These are light motifs in all of her work and indeed in her life. Her graphic work, as we will also see, is at once meticulous and meaningful, pen and ink bringing to life figures within complex narratives. Her paintings also explore this duality, combining the figurative with the abstract, the real. Mm -hmm. The subjective and the objective. Using text, found objects, and photography, her works invite the viewer to enter into these complex spheres that raise questions and stimulate dialogue. A self-described, quote, big patriot of Washington Heights as a community and the uptown stroll specifically, it is not surprising that three of her works were borrowed for the filming of the musical In the Heights. We are so excited to welcome Lilia here tonight. Lilia, we turn the floor over to you. Hi, I, I mean, after this introduction, I'm just, thank you, Neria. I wanted to thank, and I hope I don't miss anyone. I wanted to thank Noma, Neria, Martin, Michelle, um, all the Uptown artists who inspire me every time, including our last uh, Thursday with, De with Dister, which was amazing, and the uh, podcast, which I participated in. I want to thank all the artists in everywhere and in New York and, and everywhere and all my friends, my family and everyone who came today. And uh, I'm sure I missed someone, but you know, everyone I work with, um, yeah. And uh, just, yeah, that's it. <laughs> And this is my video. There's no sound, Michelle. I'm having some trouble with sound. Should I should I do mine? I can I can share my screen. Let's see. Usually it's a quick fix. Okay. Yeah. I'm up in a country with great people. Okay. Here we go. Washington Heights was the first place I lived in in New York when I came here from what was then the Soviet Union. I was 17. I had grown up in a country with great people and a great culture and an inhumane political system. We left loving our country, loving our friends, loving our home. New York City was a shock. I saw its amazing, breathtaking opportunities and its heartbreaking problems. And I realized pretty soon that the country that had taken us in, that gave me a new home, had systemic problems too. I went to college and grad school in New York, trying to figure out 
through my art, how and whether I fit here. It was not easy. Like most immigrants, I felt that I didn't belong to either my new or old home. So I stayed in New York and eventually moved back to Washington Heights, where I raised my kids, where I found great friends, and where I have my studio. And uh, the more I had this great home, the more I thought about people who did not have any. Many of my pen and inks and oil paintings were still lives that expressed my love for home, my happiness to be home. Actually, these two happy, bright still lives were borrowed for the filming of In the Heights, the musical, and uh, it comes out in four days. But another theme that is very important in my work and is threaded through much of it is that of displacement. Displacement that um, occurs as a result of war or migration and the other kind of displacement, which is loss of home, homelessness, um, which happens as a result of bad, unjust, unfair, neglectful policies. In many of my paintings, pictures of abandoned buildings that I had taken in Harlem and in the Bronx became symbols of that displacement. In this oil and uh, mixed media painting called Ghosts, there are everyday objects sitting as if left behind by some people who are no longer there. There's an abandoned building, a photograph of it, with the empty windows and with a toy lion sitting on the windowsill. There are newspaper clippings collaged on the painting. There's a cup of coffee that was poured but never drunk. There's a ghostly image of an old camera evaporated as if from some kind of radiation and next to it the blue smudge happened accidentally, but looked to me like an ineffective Statue of Liberty. In this one called Transient, there's a photograph of relatives right before the war, happy. And there's a picture that I took that is one of my favorites. Riverton Transient Hotel, itself abandoned. In many of my paintings, I used found objects and gauze. And I also started to draw figures in this sketchy kind of way. So in this one that's called uh, Remember, there's a found object, the Mexican cross. There's a picture of an abandoned church in Harlem. There's some text, the word remember. There are figures of people and swirling shapes that indicate chaos. And there are two peaches, calm and normal. In my paintings, fruit are symbols of life. And I wanted to say that I don't search for symbols. I don't think of them. They just come to me somehow by themselves. In more recent paintings, I relied less on pictures and more on abstract elements. This was a series of seven paintings. Uh, this one is called The Trial or Trial. And again, it has those familiar objects and around them um, a kind of chaos and remnants of beauty. And on many, many walls of my apartment, there are my pen and ink drawings. Many of my pen and ink drawings are about the life of women. My women are often unsafe, not free, 
uh, weighed down by society's marginalization of them to the point where they internalize it and feel sad and depressed. But many find a way out and uh, make themselves happy. They rise above the problems they love, they fight, they protect. During the pandemic, I drew only two drawings of women. These drawings were used at a American Psychiatric Association seminar. Much of my work contains images of windows. Uh, windows for me being the ultimate symbol of light or darkness, of in or out, of safety or unsafety. And um, lately, my pen and ink drawings became more abstract with the only concrete images in them being windows. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the other thing I do in addition to, as my friend put it, my solitary art making, which is my work in the community, my reaching out into the community. And uh, I do this in two ways. One is by curating art shows and the second is by teaching kids art. One of the things I really loved doing was um, co-curating with Kat Gooch Bro. Thank you, Kat. The art at Lakela shows, and um, thank you to all the artists who participated and all the people who came to see it. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic ended it, but during the pandemic, I was asked by the Hebrew Tabernacle to put together a virtual show, uh, which we called Uptown Images, and it is still up. It has work by 19 local artists of very diverse backgrounds using very different media techniques and styles, and many of whom I met at Noma's Thursdays in the last year. And the second way I love to give back is by teaching art to kids. I volunteered for six years with the Arts in Action program on the Upper West Side. I ran the Art Next Door program here in Washington Heights. And also during the pandemic, I volunteered as an art teacher at uh, PS 187, our local school. Thank you, Amy Whitner, and thank you, great kids, amazing kids who were in my classes. And as of three weeks ago, I am officially working with the Leadership Program, which is an amazing organization that sends teachers to New York cities and other cities, actually, underserved public schools. And um, I am very honored and happy to be a part of it because I think the best way to bring about change in society and uh, greater equality is through better education. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lilia. Um, I'm always so fascinated, um, you know, again, by sort of this duality in your work, you know, um, and you talk about um, displacement and, you know, obviously, you know, your own personal experiences, but I think it's so interesting now, sort of given the pandemic and given, you know, how how often we we find ourselves going to old places that we used to frequent and seeing them shuttered and you know what has that experience been like for you given you know that this is a topic that you've been so invested in for so much time and you have your you bring your own experiences to it how has this sort of amplified changed or or you know in your art and in your life in general yeah, I think that's a, that's a, as they say, it's a great question, but it really is 
you know, it's, um, it, it's very true that um, seeing um, bricked up or boarded up um, stores, uh, abandoned essentially, uh, truly just kind of brought back to me the idea of the, the, the fear of displacement. And yes, this is very different. We're all sitting in our homes, but there are people losing jobs. There are people losing their businesses. And it, you know, a lot of people compared it to like wartime. Okay, so maybe not that bad, but very distressing. Yeah. Yeah, I also think it's, you know, that I think that you, you, know, you talk about memory and you talk about, you know, displacement and displacement is, is such a personal experience, right? And, you know, it, it can mean so many things. Um, and, and I think that added layer or that added sort of piece of guilt, you know, um, do I have the right to feel displaced? Do I have the right to right. abandon? Right you know um and so one of the things i think is so fascinating about your work is how um you know how how clearly complex that experience is um and how you give sort of space to that you know even sort of the the window and you talk about the window is both something that can be menacing or can be an escape um you know you you sort of leave that option um for viewers um can you talk a little bit about that and and how that sort of figures into to your work because it, it's it really is sort of an interesting aspect of so many of your pieces um, I, I wanted to, in my video, I almost said it, but I wanted, I'll, I'll just say it now, is that I think in my work, there are a lot of questions and no, really no answers. Um, and the, well, the window is a very, you know, it's an ambiguous symbol or, or, or thing. And, um, yeah, I um, um, yeah, I would say I want to give the I, I even with the women I tell a story, but it's not it's not the story is not completely even clear to me sometimes it's I don't have a direct, you know, I'm going to draw this 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 it comes as I as I draw it comes as I work. Uh, depending on my, I guess, what's on my mind, what's in my soul and what's in the world more than, than, all, than you know, more and more lately. Um, I, I kind of, yes, I, I offer a lot of questions and a lot of memories in my, in both paintings and drawings. And some are more layered and some are obviously simpler. I mean, a work like this, for example, oh, can you go back to that, Michelle, for a sec? Sorry. Um, you know, with these these women, for example, here, um, you know, you almost get that, you know, uh, you know, you get that, that, I mean, the woman with her arms, you, you know, sort of spread out or, or sort of, you know, holding the book, and it almost looks like the arms disappear, right? Right. Um, into the background. So she almost looks like she's without agency, that she doesn't even have her arms. Well, you actually yeah. fix your gaze and you see, oh, no, her arms are outstretched. Um, they're also chained a little bit chained. and weighed yeah. down a little bit. Yeah. But at and the same time, I feel that there's there's hope there because there's some hope there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, also the, you know, the, the way you use sort of perspective, right? I mean, just yeah, sort of figuratively and, and literally, um, you know, perspective allows you to, to, to kind of escape as necessary or, 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 or not, which, right? <laughs> which I, I think is, is kind of throughout. Um, yeah, I mean, we have some interesting uh, uh, comments here. Uh, Jenny, yeah, you know, I was thinking the, the same thing. Um, Jenny, do you do you want to um, uh, do you want to ask your question or, or share your observation? Because I think that's such an interesting um, comment that you've made. 
Um, no, I just was was putting down that uh, you know when I saw them, they looked to me um, like priestesses, but almost with a bishopy type of feel, right? Like that Russian Orthodox, right? They've got the halo around them, and at the same time they're being weighed down. So it was kind of just like yeah, very complex. A lot of questions. Um, very Lilia. Yeah. <laughs> well, w women are priestesses and and sometimes um you know not not as free as they would like to be but in this one um i also wanted to say that I, again it almost these things come almost as a surprise to me i did not set out to draw just this but i see that what maybe to me is the it doesn't even matter if it's an older woman the one in the front is giving the book and the other one is receiving it, maybe it's kind of like hope for the future generation um, to be more, to have more agency. Yeah, you almost, you must get the sense that they're sort of locked away in some kind of castle or in some tower somewhere, you know, and, and they're sort of visiting and sort of, you know, trying to figure out kind of how to uh, sort of deal with all of these obstacles maybe. Uh, which, which is also so so interesting. Um, I know that there's a question also from Kat. Kat, you have a question here about your the drawings. And I think in part, Lily, you've answered it, but I think we'd like to hear a little bit more. Kat, do you wanna ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, uh, Lily, I know we've talked about your drawings and how they sort of just happen. <laughs> you know, they, they, you follow where they take you. But I'm wondering if your um, paintings are a little more planned out um, or do they sort of follow a similar path? Um, I think my paintings are a little more planned out, not maybe in the sense of knowing exactly what I'm doing, but definitely, you're so right, definitely, um, they're much tighter. There's, there's, there's much less accident, even though this smudge is one and I liked it, but there's much less, um, I almost really don't know when I'm drawing, like what the next thing is going to be. And also with um, pen and ink drawings, there's no going back. Once the line is there, it's there. With paintings, I tend to rework and rework and rework. And so as a result, they're much more controlled and even if not completely planned from the beginning they end up being um yeah uh, more deliberate um that's it that's yeah I, I mean i think that's that's interesting do, do you feel um i mean just in your own process how do you how do you go between both you know do you feel like sometimes you get exhausted in, in sort of one place and sort of want to do or how, how do you how do you sort of negotiate that process well drawing is something i do like literally all the time i i have a pen and a, some paper and i start doing it i i just and sometimes it's a little thing sometimes it grows into a bigger thing sometimes it grows into nothing but drawing is something i do probably almost every day and painting is is like, um, you know, painting is like like traveling. I don't know. I I I guess I I don't go in there and I don't go into my. I have a little studio where I paint, and and I guess that kind of is planned. Like I'm going to paint. I'm going to set aside the time, um, prepare somehow it's it's kind of very different from drawing which just yeah drawing is just like happens that's so interesting as a result there are a lot more drawings than paintings because <laughs> as i said i also tend to oh change and change and change things in paintings so each painting just takes forever I, mean, I think the content is different um, as well. Susan, you're, you, you were sort of um, mentioning that. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, 
Is Susan here? Okay, uh, maybe we can come back uh, to Susan. Um, I think also Carrie had a question. Carrie, how about? Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just noticing all the books, Lilia, and I know you've done a lot of writing as well. And just curious, you know, I mean, they speak for themselves, but also what they mean to you in the paintings and the drawings. Yeah, well, it's 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 more books as knowledge, you know, out there in the world, not what I've what I've tried to do is uh you know, very sort of personal and, but uh, I am, yes, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of books in the world, in the local store and on my own bookshelves that I probably will not have the time to read. So I think, yeah, I think a book you can say is a symbol of all that knowledge that's there and may be available, but you know, um, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I think also, you know, you talk about sort of memory or you talk about these worlds that are available. I mean, of course, a book, you know, it's, it's like you dive into a book and you're, you know, you're traveling. I mean, you talked about traveling, yeah. sort of that concept. So you can see how they would be correlated um, in that way. Um, we have a question from Bob about your process. Bob, do you want to ask your question? Actually, it's Judy asking because I'm sitting next to Bob. <laughs> uh, my question was, is do you sketch out your paintings before committing paint to canvas? Um, the answer is no. Oh. Wow. <laughs> which is why, which is why I, is probably why I end up fixing and, and redoing so much, except occasionally something I have drawn um, makes me want to transfer it to, uh, into a paint, to make it into a painting. And then I just kind of look at it and then you sort of, sort of look at my drawing and paint what's and paint the painting so no no um no pre conceived no Never no seen. even though i was taught in my in my some of my some of my of the guests here know how we were taught in russia to you know academic painting and how we were taught to compose and sketch and this and that and make a little drawing on the corner that totally works out your composition. No, I don't do that. And maybe I should, <laughs> I don't. No, keep it real, Lilia. Okay. <laughs> I wanna to try to go back to Susan. I don't know if Susan is back, but if not, I will ask her a question. Um, Susan, are you there? I can unmute you. Okay, I'll ask you a question. Um, her question has to do with women and, and how prominently they figure in your drawings, but not in your paintings. Um, you know, and I know a lot of this you say sort of is, is, is kind of just comes to you and it's intuitive, like the, you know, sort of the, the many fruits that appear in your, in, your, in your paintings and perhaps not in the same way. How about the, the question of women in, in, in sort of in one uh, area and not in the other? It's so that through your questions, yours, Neria, and my friends and, and our guests, I'm kind of like learning things about myself. And I think, <laughs> because, no, seriously, I think it's because um, the drawings of women happen very um, spontaneously. I literally always, always do all my drawings in one sitting. It doesn't take long. I'm very fast with this. And, and as I explained, paintings is a whole different thing. And I think I'm in a whole different mode, like a much less internal mode and much more, you know, my, my objects, I, I rely on the objects and those windows and sometimes abstraction, like abstract elements to 
maybe convey some of my questions, but yeah, there, 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 there are no women in my paintings. There's not one. <laughs> That's so interesting. And I never, I never thought of it until just now. And of course, you know, I mean, the, the, the images with the women are so, um, they're so detailed, you know, um, and, and so, you know, so, so sort of that's an interesting, uh, um, you know, concept that I maybe, you know, sort of points to sort yeah. of all the various levels that you know women or or you yourself or that we you know the the, the complex the complexity of, of 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 sort of you know being a, a woman or, or thinking in those terms it's so interesting to see I, I think that's one of the things that's fascinating to me so much about your work is the range um uh and 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 the breadth of of your work um uh you know um and and sort of the incorporation at times of 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 text and of language and and um and then in other cases sort of just the object almost the object anchored um you know in in some way of course all of that i think deals you know if you have the umbrella of displacement and you have the umbrella right of of considering those questions um you can see that there's not one solution to that and i so i think you know you touch on that sort of just visually we, we we see that um i think uh irina had an interesting question as well uh are you here can you let's see can we unmute you okay let's we can we'll come back to Irina. um regina has a question Regina. Okay. While you are unmuting Regina, I'm so glad she made it because she's on on bath duty for her grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Regina. So Regina, as, Regina, oh, there you are. Good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. As, as um, someone who's very interested in people and their history, uh, is there anyone else in your family? Uh, from whom you think you inherited your talent? And also, what does your family think of your artistry? And are they talented your way? Hmm. Well, my, my father, who actually died three months ago, was, could draw, but never pursued it. My mom can also draw somewhat, again, never pursued it. They were both engineers. My kids tried um, at various ages of whatever, 12, 10 and gave up. And my husband is not in that, um, not artistic uh, in that sense, not, doesn't have uh, that as his, one of his talents at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they, they all, well, what I'm, I mean, parents, maybe, of course, I am almost, I'm very happy that my kids like my work. And, uh, you know, I often say something like, oh, there's so much, like, what am I going to do with it? And, and they, they're just like, don't throw anything out. Ah, <laughs> I wish my kids would say that. <laughs> oh, well, they're, they're, they're not, yeah, maybe once they, actually see and uh, realize how much there is maybe, but that's what they say right now. They're very young. That's an interesting question. How do you, um, how, how, what is your experiment? You've dealt with children, you know, in the education system. How do you talk to them about your art? What kind of questions do they ask? Because I'm always fascinated by the questions children ask when they, you know, because they come without the inhibitions and without, you know, uh, they just kind of, they're looking, right? Which is what we, right. what we should. I, I they... try okay. to bring myself and my work in, if you look at the, um, if you, the room where I give lessons sometimes doesn't have my work. Uh, I try to bring myself into my art, into uh, that process as little as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, I don't even 
I'm not big on even demonstrating how to draw this because I want them to draw what they see and what they feel and think. And of course, you know, I tell them that they, they inevitably say, oh, you're so, you can do it so well. And I tell them that I've studied, I'm much older than you and I have a lot of experience studying it, but also it's, it's, it's how you see it. it there are plenty, thousands of artists that draw not realistically, that, that draw shapes and colors only. And uh, there are no less amazing artists. So yeah. And sometimes they ask me to show some things and, and I do, but. And what, and what do they say? What are their, do they ask questions? Do they just make observations or what do they? What do they do? I, I actually brought, uh, because of the, Zoom, the whole Zoom issue and whatever, it's a little bit different teaching now because I can't come yeah. close to them. I've done some in-person lessons, but I have to stand far away. So instead of, and whatever, the PowerPoint wasn't working at the school. So I brought one of my, I brought the paintings that were borrowed for In the Heights. And they, <laughs> the questions, they, first they were, of course, they said, how did you do this? And I said, this is just what you do. It's like drawing a shape. And then, you know, I mean, a million questions, like, do you have this teapot? No, not necessarily. <laughs> you play the, lots of interesting questions. Yeah, that question of like, do you have the teapot means, you know, did you, did you make it up in your head or did you look at something and, and draw after it, right? Right. Yeah. But in a sense, I don't have that teapot, but right. it's, it's like the teapot of my memories. And one of the drawings has, a, one of those paintings has a, a, a cup with brushes. So that's, that's easy. Like this, these are my brushes I love, not this one, the other one. Mm. The other long one. That one. There we but, go. Yeah. Yeah. That's my coffee. I like. You know. That's actually. I tell them that's a um, on the square kind of dish is a pen, like a open nib pen that I'm so old that I used to use those at some point, just like and I tell them like Shakespeare or like the Declaration of Independence. Now I use mechanical things. And uh, I don't play the cello or anything at all, but I like music. So that kind of all ties into, you know, these are my things. That's great. Um, I think Arena had a question. Let's see if we can have her unmute. I don't know if uh, we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Oh, there you are. Are you muted? Let's unmute you. I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know why it's not unmuting, but your question is, uh, what are your plans for the future? <laughs> the big question. Well, my plans for the future are to teach kids to um, continue doing volunteer um, I mean, any kind in any apply myself to in this community and while I'm teaching in Brooklyn now in other communities, just do as much as I can with that. I would like to uh, come back to design uh, in some, the industry is in a bit of a disarray, but yeah. uh, I want to mention, I think some people who I worked with for many years are on this call and I was part of the most amazing team of people who understood beauty and understood like humanity and warmth. And I might as, you know, I wanted also to, to mention that uh, Kate Spade as a company was very um, attentive to needs of disadvantaged kids. We did high school mentorship every year. And they also did this whole program of building a, 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 a small factory in Rwanda and also building a health clinic for them. So I loved that place. I loved my, my coworkers. So 
hopefully in some way I can go also incorporate design into that, into my life too. The, the answer, the other answer is I am now, my kids are out of the house. So, so that's, that's like, you know, that's a whole new, that's a whole new world. A whole new world. Before we go on to a rapid fire, which you know is coming uh -oh. up, I did want to ask one more thing. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the works that you use during um, the a Tale of Two Cities? Um, I think you mentioned uh, at the American Group a psychotherapy conference. Oh. Uh, I think Nellie actually here has mentioned that. Is there something you'd like to say about that? Or Nelly, are you here? Would you like to respond? Let's see. Uh, I think we're having some trouble unmuting. I might have, I might have named the organization incorrectly. It was something like that. Okay. Well, do you do you want to mention a little bit about that before we move on to? A rapid fire. Well, these I did in in April uh, or yeah, April 2020, which is I think when it hit us or me anyway, how bad this is and can be, and how you know at that point I felt um, like everybody else. I mean, we lived, we we went on with our lives, but really felt very powerless and. Uh, no thanks to our government. Uh, our hands were tied. Our, um, you know, again, uh, there are more abstract things in this than, than it's almost as if these these women don't have concrete memories. It's like everything changed. It's almost like um, there's chaos and, um, well. This, these two uh, squares I read as x-rays of lungs and wheels that are just turning and we don't know, you know, how to stop them. And well, this one is, I mean, this, this may be a little almost obvious. This one is kind of lobotomized or brainwashed, which is what we were in the beginning of this thing and throughout much of it and yeah, and um, powerless. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jenny just remarked that they look like they're floating within the nightmare. And I think yeah. a really um, great description. Um, this has been so fascinating. And I hope you take a minute before we, you know, before we end today to look at, um, to read the chat, um, really some lovely comments uh, throughout. Um, and uh, it, I think it's it's really a wonderful. I mean, uh, with so many participants here tonight. Um, and it's really I'm so grateful to everyone. <laughs> well, as a testament, of course, um, to you and, and, and to your work. All right, so we're going to move to our rapid fire. So we have- um, Wish me luck, people. You're gonna be great. One question I wanna ask, um, and I'm, I'm really interested uh, um, in your response. Uh, who or what is your favorite artist, artwork, or art movement? You know, we, we, there's so many, I think, um, I'm sure you could talk about so many. It's such a it's a tough question. Really, not a favorite. I mean, who is what? I don't know. Who do you want to mention? I guess it's a it's a tough question to ask. Um, so it's an well, easy I, I expected that question, perhaps. Ah, okay. And, uh, I I really it changes so much. It, it's mm -hmm. from Rembrandt to last week's Dister. I'm <laughs> really. Um, I respond very um, readily, I think, to things I see. So it could be not that I like everyone, not at all. I go to a lot of galleries and I and, and things don't say don't speak to me, but uh, many things do. And I just I don't know if Michelle wants to show the couple of paint the couple of examples that I put there. There's this uh, artist Maria Izquierdo. Yep. Uh, who somehow to me has that, yes, that displacement, nostalgia, uh, question in her work there, right under me. Yeah. And uh, 
then the the Russian artist Petrov Vodkin, um, well, obviously amazing, amazing technique and the idea of using, which many artists did, but I feel like he, I, I think he did it in such a way of these everyday objects. Again, you can see where I get my un, undrunk cup of tea and letters. And this is a Russian icon of the, of Our Lady. And I also know that much of it was painted. This is 2016. Okay, so it's during the uh, Civil War, which I mean, during the during World World War One, which quickly led to the revolution. So the context of this piece, and it's I mean, it's beyond beautiful to me as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, I, I, I love this question and I, and I tend to ask it of everyone who participates. Um, so I'll ask it of you. You're having that dinner party, that famous dinner party. We did this, I did this tonight with my children um, and you have three guests, dead or alive, real fictional. Who are they? What are you serving for dinner? Tell me about that dinner party. Okay, so that again, I, I was since, um, since I have a lot of questions and worries about the state of the world and the state of our country in particular, I would like to invite to my dinner, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton himself. Oh. And, uh, you know, and, and like talk over things, like what's going on? Like what <laughs> did, they, did they get, where did we go wrong? Or was it wrong from the beginning? And the beginning of America is not that, you know, that far away. So we can maybe trace to where things went wrong. And some of them I even I know. And um, I don't cook at all. So I would have to invite my husband, who is an excellent <laughs> cook. And he's also a journalist. And he knows, uh, well, I go to him with questions when I don't have Lin-Manuel and Hamilton. I ask my husband endless questions. So it'll be the three of them and me. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Um, yeah, that, that's great. All right, what is on your nightstand? Um, well, there's, you want the real answer? Well, you deal with real, you deal with the- Okay, okay, okay. No, there, there, are three, <laughs> there are three pictures of my kids as babies because I just can't get over the fact that they're no longer babies. There's um, uh, a body oil, Elizabeth W. San Francisco, which I love, love, love. And there's a book I'm reading now, which my daughter gave me for my birthday, um, which is, uh, it, it tells the story of Pride and Prejudice from the point of view of Darcy and, it, and, and his growing desire for Elizabeth, which in, in, in to me in Jane Austen, it just pops up out of nowhere, but here, this this explains it. Fascinating. Um, yeah, the question, did Rembrandt have to respond to what was on his nightstand or try that on Picasso? Yeah, that, <laughs> that would be uh, certainly interesting. Again, maybe they have to go imagined or, uh, you know, we, we, I guess we'll, we'll never know. Rembrandt would have a, a, a lot, he would probably just refuse to answer the question or refuse to answer oh. all the questions, perhaps. <laughs> um, okay, here's a question which I think is kind of interesting uh, for you. Um, if you had a time machine, would you travel back or forward in time? And it's an either or? Back. I mean, the way it's written, it's either or, but let's hear what you have to say. Back, definitely back. back. Okay, how come? Um, cause I kind of know how to mm. some degree how it was and I don't know what's coming. And this question I completely was not prepared for and I immediately <laughs> thought the future, who knows, you know, I'll go to the past. Yeah, that's, that's so, so yeah, I mean, I think it, 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 it hints at sort of the discomfort of the, of the not knowing, right? Which we talked in your artwork, I mean, as well. I mean, it's something that kind of comes up, right? This sort of, you know, uh, that that piece. So that's interesting. Um, all right, we have two more. What is your favorite spot uptown? Ooh. 
Um, they are, I don't know if it's called an arcade, the arcade in the park in Fort Tryon Park, when you go down the, it's, it's like vaulted. I, I don't know what it was. I, I actually heard that it was like a stables or something. Anyway, that place where there's also often musicians and there's amazing acoustics. It's very, it's, it's not where most people go. It's, it's slow down almost towards the highway. And it's, okay. I like that a lot, but, but I like many places uptown. Someone is saying that was the driveway to the original mansion. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, last question. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh my God. Um, peace. I mean, I want to be realistic. I know that bad things happen. Perfect happiness is when bad things that don't need to happen don't happen. So yes, we all, there. there's some calamity in the world. There's some, um, you know, disease. Uh, there are things that go wrong. But when things that could have been right, go wrong. That's really bad. And so when that doesn't happen, that's perfect happiness. That's a great, um, that's a great answer to a very- I've yet to find yeah. Yeah, that place. That's a great answer. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's what we all would like to, to see happen. That's a really, that's a really great answer. And as you said, sort of grounded in, in, in sort of realism, but also, aspirational and yeah. it would lend a sense of, of, of as you said just peace right we accept yeah. the we accept the duality right of our existence but um i like that's a great answer this is fascinating um really enjoyed having you here tonight it was really wonderful the hour flew by um thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your work with us and sharing your thoughts with us and your process and 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 your ideas it's really been a very meaningful evening um thank you all thank you. for being here tonight we really appreciate having you we appreciate your contributions and your questions um and deborah i have a whole host of new questions that you've suggested so i'm going to put those into the rapid fire circulation for, so thanks for those um before we uh, go tonight, I would like to reintroduce uh, Martin Collins, who has some announcements to make um, before we close out for the evening. Martin. Thank you, Nuria. Tomorrow, Friday, July 4th at 10 a.m., please join us at Grow with Google to create a compelling brand and website during a free online workshop. Please see nomanyc.org for info. It's a jam-packed Uptown Arts Row weekend with the Juan Pablo Duarte Festival, Hike the Heights, Centro Cultural Dominicano's Arts and Cultural Health Fair, the New York City Multicultural Festival and Harlem Stage Repertorio Espanol all on Saturday, June 5th. On Sunday, June 6th, drums along the Hudson, Siempre Luis, an outdoor concert at the Hispanic Society Museum. Taikosa Japanese Drums, meantime, Hyde Piper Children's Theater will present Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma both weekend days at multiple locations. Please see nomanyc.org for complete information and pick up this week's Manhattan Times with a special Uptown Art Stroll insert. On Monday, June 7th at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum, NOMA presents Jazz Power Initiative live at 6.30 p.m. Finally, this year's Uptown Art Stroll honorees, Eric K. Washington, historian and author, Elizabeth Starchevich, weaver and artist. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us this evening. Danny Bonilla and the Dykeman Muralist Collective, the Association of Dominican Classical Artists, and Warner Brothers will be recognized in a special video coming soon on our website, nomanyc.org. There's no Thursdays with Noma next week. We'll see you Thursday, June 17th at 7.30 p.m. with the Harlem School of the Arts. Thank you all for joining us and good night, everyone. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank I, you, Lilia. Humbled and honored and everything. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. You too.